Welcome, everybody. Let's take a moment to settle in together. I'm just going to see the faces who's here. Uh, just so you know, with these somatic drop-ins, they are recorded, but we turn off the feature to accidentally unmute yourself. So if you turn your camera on now, no one's ever going to see you in the recording. The only people that are seen is if you actually speak later when we allow people to unmute. So it's nice to be able to see you here. So I'm going to look through the faces. I see some familiar ones. I see a lot of people I've never seen before. So welcome here. I'm going to orient you to my team and then we're going to dive in. Nice. Okay, so I'm Luis Mojica. I'm the founder of Holistic Life Navigation and I love doing these by by monthly i guess we do a monthly one technically uh, we also work with samadhi new york and we do an addiction circle that's free every month so uh, the bi-monthly is really monthly because it's a free thing every month it's just different but the somatic drop-in gives me a space to just kind of drop in and talk about whatever feels current or present and teach some things along with my wonderful team which i'm going to introduce you to so i'm going to start with camille leek do you want to let them know a little bit about you Hello, everyone. My name is Camille Leek. I am the uh, community manager at HLN, and I will be supporting today's session. You may hear me chime in from time to time, also as an assistant teacher. And we also have Khadija here with her, with us. Uh, she's four months old tomorrow. So if you see me looking down, that is who I'm orienting to. Thanks, love. Marika Malaya. Hi, I'm Rika. I am the operations manager at HLN. I love doing the somatic drop-ins. Um, one, because Khadija shows up, and also because we get to see so many new people that we don't see like in our membership or in the course. So, welcome. Thanks, Marika. Then we have Evan Adams. Hi, everyone. My name is Evan. I am the admin assistant here, as well as a podcast producer and also a sound healing practitioner that I get to collaborate with very often. I really appreciate. Um, yeah. So if you send an email, that'll come to me. Um, and, you know, so I'm always here available to help with tech questions or general questions. If you send the email again to info at holistic life navigation, that's me. So that's the beautiful team and they're going to be helping in this session. So uh, Camille is going to be orienting to people when they put their hands up, when it's time to ask questions and share things. And she'll also be chiming in and co-teaching and facilitating with me in that way. And Marika will be in charge of the chat. So if anything comes up for you through the session, you have a question about, or you just want to connect, you want to reach out to somebody, just DM Marika. Okay. If you DM me, I'm not going to see it. Um, Camille might see it, but if you keep with Marika, it will definitely be seen. Okay. So we usually just drop in and don't have a specific theme, but today we do have something we're going to work with. So I'm going to introduce that. And then I want some input from everyone about where that goes for you, what you're wanting to learn with that, what your practices around this. And so we're going to play with boundaries today. Um, specifically, what is a boundary like through a somatic lens? What's the difference between having an intuitive somatic boundary that's fluid and flexible compared to an intellectual one that's just fixed? That's like, I have to always feel this way about this person or situation always because we can't trust ourselves to maintain how we feel or even know how we feel. So we're going to play with that a bit because I find in a lot of the work we do, some of the most, um, I would say maybe the, the root of a lot of our relational ruptures is not understanding our own boundaries. And when you have a fawning response, your body has been trained to bypass boundaries and appear to be enjoying whatever the, the situation or experience is. So if you're used to fawning or freezing, you don't even have access to boundaries. If you're used to fighting or flighting, you might be over boundaried. So there's a, a lot we can go into it today. We're not going to have time for the whole thing because, I mean, we could talk about this for, for hours. There's so much to it. Um, but I thought we could start just by first feeling our bodies and then going to a little sharing around what boundaries mean to you all. And then we'll go into a little bit of the practice and the lecture. So even with the word boundaries, notice right now your boundaries and not how we think of boundaries in the world of like, yes or no, or you're not allowed or none of that. 
but somatically, like your skin, your skin is the boundary for your blood and your bones and your muscles and your organs. Like, let's just feel our skin for a moment. And some of you are like immediately self-touching, beautiful, go for it. Others are sitting still, like there's no wrong way or right way to do this. But can you feel your skin? What does it feel like? What's the temperature in the room like? What parts of the body do you have access to? Like what parts are like, oh yeah, I feel that. And what parts feel completely numb and isolated or lost to you? We first want to notice like how much of me is even here with me, how much my body is present. You can't know boundaries until you know your body. Because all boundaries really are at the end of the day of the expression of your body's needs. Your body's thirsty, you reach for a glass of water, boundary. You're tired, you say to a friend, I can't talk anymore, boundary. You're overwhelmed by somebody, you don't want to see them, I can't see you, boundary. It comes from your physicality, it comes from a physical felt sense of too much or not enough. And there's some kind of reaching out and expression that happens. And that's what we that's what we call it communicating boundaries. But if we even remove the word boundary, we're just getting to know somatically what our body's needs are. But if we can't feel our body, we don't know. We're just guessing or we're saying what we think we should be feeling, but not what we're actually feeling. So notice that as you sit here right now, like what are my body's boundaries? Do I want to stretch my arms out? Do I have something like close to me that I want to push away? Do I want to get up and walk over to the other part of the room? Like play with having boundaries just in the room. We call this renegotiating your boundaries. Anyone that's experienced trauma has experienced boundary violation. There's many layers of boundary violation. So renegotiating boundaries means your body gets to say, oh, right now I have agency over what my body experiences. And from what I can see on the camera, from those who I can see, you all have that agency right now. You're in a situation that you get to choose where you're sitting. You get to choose what you're wearing. You get to choose if your camera's on or off, right? So really attuning to your agency and feeling what that's like to know you get to create how you want to show up in the space you're in right now. That's huge for a nervous system that developed in situations where you didn't have choice. So really honoring that for a moment. And when you touch your chest or your belly or you hold a pillow, anyone that's new to my work, I always just having a pillow nearby and just holding it. And oh my gosh, the changes that emerge just from squeezing a pillow are profound. So if you haven't done it before, try it with me now and see what happens. Just hold it and notice what parts soften inside. How does my breath change? What happens as they sit with us? And just take a moment to feel that. And just to bring this in so it's not such a vast topic, let's really focus today on overwhelm and the relationship between overwhelm and boundaries. Because this is where we leave the relational realm. It's not just about human to human or human to animal or human to plant. It can be body to vibration. A really loud sound can feel like a boundary violation because it is. It permeates something in the body and overwhelms the system a really powerful smell, not eating and having low blood sugar. These are all things that the body experiences as threat and potential violation of boundary as if someone did something physical to the body. So we can go to the obvious if someone literally violated my boundaries physically or something overwhelms my body. And whenever the body goes into overwhelm, it goes into stress response and then possibly trauma response. And that's the fight, flight, freeze, fall in response. So as you're hearing the word boundaries and we're connecting it to overwhelm on a somatic level, we can start to see how so many times through the day, our boundaries are being overwhelmed and we're bypassing it. Purposely, because we don't want to look weird, like a car alarm goes off and we don't want to jump. So we just hold still like we're cool, even though inside something you're really scared. 
that's one simple situation of how that builds through the day. Another one, like I was saying earlier, fawning, the body reflexively going into people pleasing. So the other one thinks you're enjoying the conversation, the situation. You even think you are. Your body's tricking you into thinking so because it's part of this reflexive social response. Meanwhile, the whole time boundaries are being violated, you're being overwhelmed by the person or situation. So it's really a question of how in, in relationship are we to our overwhelm and to responding to our overwhelm? Can we even feel our overwhelm? Can we only feel it when it's panic attack level? Or can we feel it when it's like a one, when it's just a whisper? That's the greatest thing to be able to build capacity for in somatic work is feeling those little somatic sensational cues that your body's getting close to overwhelm so you can respond to it before tipping over into stress or trauma response. Camille, anything you want to add to this? And then we'll open up some weaving. Um, one thing I just wanted to highlight, we talked about um, the fluidity of somatic boundaries versus intellectual boundaries. And it's really important that we think about it as being fluid. And our boundaries are fluid because our capacity is fluid. The boundaries, because of the capacity I have one day, my capacity the next day may not be the same. So then my boundaries are also going to follow. And again, that can cause some frustration as we've talked about in some other somatic drop-ins, the fact that our capacity isn't stagnant, that it's not set in stone. And that because it's fluid, it does require us to be present. We have to check in. What is my body's capacity today? And then when I can be aware of my body's capacity today, what does that mean for my boundaries? I'm really glad you brought that in. When I was speaking about blood sugar, that's exactly what I'm talking about there is capacity. And capacity changes by the hour. It can change by the minute, depending on what you're going through. Sometimes you have a co-creation of capacity. Like you can say, I'm going to eat some food that will actually nurture my capacity. Other times you have no say over it. Like your body woke you up three hours before you wanted to be up and you can't fall back to sleep. You don't always have say over that. That lowers your capacity for information, for sensation, and for experience through the day. So day-to-day -day capacity changes. My capacity, if it's low one day, can't hang out with certain friends. My capacity, when it's much higher other days, loves those same people dearly. So that's what we mean when we talk about fluid somatic boundaries. I don't have to have this one rule for how I'm allowed to be with you in my life. I can let my body tell me day-to-day. And not all relationships are cool with that. So you're going to lose some friends if you really go that way. But you'll find that the ones that are can do that with you too. And you get this much more honest relationship of just checking in based on capacity. So let's open up for 10 minutes of weaving. And 10 minutes of weaving just means two options. You can send a DM to Marika. She'll speak it for you anonymously. If you don't want to be seen or heard, this is recorded. So this will exist at some point on the podcast and on YouTube. It's a free resource and it helps a lot of people. If you have no problem being recorded, you can just put your hand up. Camille will call on people, uh, usually intuitively. And based on that, you have 30 seconds, we ask, you know, for the weaving, a minute at the most, but I really like to keep it around 30 seconds. Just what you want to contribute to this, a question, an intention, an experience, your own wisdom, like something you're getting from us saying this now to throw like a little ingredient to this cauldron we're stirring. And then we can do a, a larger lecture, a group practice. And then if we have time, we can do some questions toward the end, some comments. So when your hand is up in a half a minute or so, Camille will start calling on people. You can unmute Again, 30 seconds to a minute, we will give you a time check. So know that, uh, not because we don't want to hear you, but because we want to hear as many people as we can. Okay. And if your camera is on, you will be seen. This is recorded. It's up to you how you want to negotiate that. Okay. But once it's recorded, it's recorded. So it's going to be very clear about that. So I'm going to enable it so people can unmute themselves and Camille will choose people. Um, and just to let folks know, I will be calling out the name that I see in the little Zoom box. And if I mispronounce your name, please correct me. Let me know. Um, if you're having any trouble raising your hand to ask a question, you can check in with Evan and he can support you. All right. Um, T, please come off mute. Hello. Hi, this is Tiffany. 
Uh, I'm wondering how do we navigate and negotiate boundaries when we are in relationship without making ourselves or another person or them making us feel as though we are burdensome or too much? Thank you. I'm just going to be jotting these things down and we'll kind of put it all into the, the, the piece today. Um, Nina, please come off mute. Um, so first of all, Louise, I love your work and love listening to your podcasts. And, um, so my intention today is just to learn as much as I can through what you have to say in the lecture and, and what other people have to say. Thank you. Um, Abby, please come off mute. And I definitely would love some feedback on this. Um, basically, when I feel like it's a character flaw with myself, but when I feel disrespected and it takes a lot for me to get to that point, I want to be mean and punish the other person to, it could just basically be purely out of like, you disrespected me. Now I want to be mean. Now I want to be cruel to you. And once I'm at that level, it's like, I almost go into like a blackout rage and it may be, ha it rarely happens, but when it does, it takes me sometimes up to a week to actually like come back down. And I want to learn why that happens and how to avoid that. Appreciate the honesty. Thank you for that. Uh, Lottie, please come off mute. Um, I was just thinking of a moment today where I set a boundary and I was proud of it and I just wanted to share. Uh, so I'm a tattoo artist um, and it takes like a lot of concentration. And today I had a client that was getting like a few pieces from me. Um, and by like, so we were doing three by the second one, it was a lot bigger than I thought. And I was like getting really tired. Um, and then I like asked if they would be able to like come back to do the other one another day. Um, but yeah, I was just, they were really nice about it, but I was just like glad that I like checked in with my like capacity and was like, actually I like could do this, but I would be like pushing myself past my boundaries and would be really, really exhausted afterwards and not be able to do what I planned in the evening. So Beautiful, Je beautiful example of how boundaries can be really gentle and almost like effortless. I love that. Thank you for that. Uh, Scott, please come off mute. Scott, are you able to come off mute? All right, we'll come back to you in a bit. Uh, Maybe Evan, oh. Evan will reach out to him. Okay. Uh, Philip, please come off mute. Let's go to the next person. Okay. Uh, Dahlia, please come off mute. Thank you. And thank you for this space. Um, you talked about boundaries being an expression of your needs. I have a chat, a background um, experience with childhood trauma and a big suppression around my voice. And it's something that I'm constantly in currently working on. And so I'm wondering how that like ties in and how that can be soothed in moments when you're trying to use it. Cause I feel my nervous system like jitter up and get all sorts of crazy and worked up. I do facilitation work. I'm a speaker. So it's like very much so a part of my also purpose in life. Um, so just skills and tools around that. Thank you, Dahlia. Uh, Jonathan, please come off mute. Hi. Excuse me. Um, what I noticed is I'm in a position in my life where I'm extremely materially destabilized, financially destabilized. And usually I'm very good at self-regulating myself and regulating myself with other people. 
but like since I'm frankly fucked on that very roof level, I'm noticing my boundaries are like totally all over the place when I'm like listening to you talk about it. I'm like, right, I know all these things, but I've lost touch with them because I've been in a sort of trauma response for a long time. So I guess uh, I guess I'm asking like how to ground in a situation that feels that catastrophic. Absolutely. Found boundaries again. Thank you for that. You got it. Uh, Katie, please come off mute. Thank you for this beautiful space. This is Katie, and I'm loving holding the pillow. I've never done that before. I just grabbed my meditation pillow, so thank you for this suggestion. I had a realization earlier this morning uh, in a spiritual business uh, class that I was in that my people are not strangers, and I just wanted to share that because um, if we're connecting with people that feel really good to us, then I think um, often not always, but they might be on the same page with us in terms of boundaries and where we are with exploring them. So you aren't strangers. Hello to everyone. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Let's do one more, Camille, and then I'm going to turn to Marika to read some stuff she might have. Okay. Um, Petra, please come off mute. Hi, Um, sorry, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to get to do this. So I was trying to type it. Um, my question is around somatic discernment and essentially um, how we negotiate or how we, I don't know what the, a better word for that would be, but how to differentiate, I guess, between when we're someone who's had some people pleasing and fawning, especially with, um, sorry, uh, my heart is racing. Take Ooh. your time. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> um, like hi stress response hello um when we've had issues with fawning and people pleasing with people in authority specifically I'm in the midst of a rupture with a therapist of six years so it's like this weird space um and when I'm in session with her trying to like get her to see the harm that she's done and to have some level of like accountability and hopefully relational repair um I want to like fight for the thing, right? Like I've been very much mindful of my body, but when I'm out of session, my body has this, like, when I sit with it in my body, it's like, no, like she's not hearing you leave. And so I want to, I, there's just like something there of like how, when you feel two things in two different scenarios, how do you proceed in? Cause I have mm -hmm. concern. Is this when I'm with her repeating a pattern that from childhood and kind of like pleading to be heard and not mm -hmm. be heard? Mm -hmm. wanted context so yeah. thank you i appreciate these sessions so so much you are so welcome we camille and i love that that topic we're going to definitely go into that like how do you deal with people that won't be accountable right it's it's great it's a great question <laughs> marika do you want to read some things you have in the chat yeah i was just going to say that i did get a lot of um questions around um building boundaries when you have really low capacity, um, like um, if you have chronic illness, um, if you're dating, if you have little kids, um, that seemed to be really, um, people were writing in about that. Um, also, <clears throat> let's see, um, let me get to the bottom here. What is, let me is sacrifice and compromise a necessary part of boundary building within relationship with others and ourself? That was one. And um, how does one deal with the panic of rejection and abandonment, like in the moment when you set a boundary or need to set a boundary? Beautiful. Even that, thank you. That last one is really powerful because if we go to the fawn response, that's the whole purpose of the fawn response, right? So if you're not if you're not aware of the fawn response, it's a it's a trauma response, which means it's biological and it's reflexive. So you're not consciously decide deciding to fawn. Your body's just fawning, right? The whole purpose of fawning is to prevent a possible rupture. So if I'm like out to dinner with somebody and they're talking about something that I vehemently disagree with, and I laugh and I nod, why, right? Because the idea of disagreement is too close to the threat of abandonment. 
or rejection or not belonging or losing something or like loss of some kind of security that I'll actually my body to be more clearly will bypass my authentic expression for attachment. Gabor Mate will say that we will bypass authenticity for attachment. And that's the whole point of fawning, right? So I want us just to kind of hear that and feel that as we heard that just that last question, I want to open this up with that because a lot of us will have this, you know, again, this, um, this shame or this pressure on ourselves, why we aren't good at expressing our boundaries. Like what's wrong with me? Why don't I just express? It's like when you have it, and this is part of what Dahlia brought up, when you have a history of childhood trauma, especially childhood trauma, because it also means developmental, like your body developed in the stress, right? It's it's really easy in those situations. Oh, I'm sorry, something's happening here. Can you hear me, Camille? Yeah, I can hear you. So my micro, oh, here we go, okay. So it's really easy in those situations developmentally to assume that your voice or your expression is going to equal a threat, right? So we call it overcoupling, right? If I say what I'm feeling, if I say what I'm needing, if I, if I yell, if I cry, any kind of expression of a boundary equals something bad happening. Now, bad happening can be like I'm physically harmed. It can be I'm screamed at. It can be I'm left. I'm misattuned. I'm abandoned. All those things can happen as we're developing. So we develop this concept, which is based on experience, that my expression is going to equal some kind of painful rupture here. So we just don't express. And if we go back to boundary, we think about it again, and, and uh, I'm just looking at what I wrote down, and I believe it was still from Dahlia's share. Yeah, I wrote down in response to her share, when the boundary implodes. Because what a boundary is, is an expression right? And when it feels unsafe to express it, what happens? We repress it. It is an implosion that takes place. Implosions are biochemical. Like we literally get inflamed on the inside from these implosions. We become adrenalized. We have excess neurotransmissions. So we get really excited and burnt out feeling. Our heart rate goes up. Our blood pressure goes up. An entire physiology shifts within seconds when something implodes. We all know what that feels like. It's a really intense feeling. What's interesting is expressing the boundary and being rejected as an adult is less painful to the body than the repression. Whether you know that or not, doesn't make it easier. But just so we know, somatically speaking, when you let it out, even if it equals the eventual decline or the disintegration of the relationship, the body can actually handle it more than repressing it. Why? Because when it implodes, it gets stuck. It doesn't just like implode and like magically dissolve. It implodes and gets stored somewhere, right? That's important because this is why we have a hard time with our voice. This is why we have stomach issues. You can actually get chronic digestive issues like IBS, um, inflammation, uh, indigestion, just from implosion of the boundary. Because when I want to say stop, and I don't, everyone try this right now. You're all muted. Take a breath and just with your hands go, stop. Yeah, we're going to do one more time. Notice your belly when you do it. So pull your hands back and go, stop. Do you feel all that force that comes out of your stomach to propel that? Your stomach is the seat of your fight response. So this is a fight response, putting your hands out. When a mosquito is flying by your, your face and you do this, this is a fight, a fight response. It's not always about violence. It's just about your body negotiating the boundaries between you and a possible threat or overwhelm right? So that fight response comes, it's like the seed of it comes from your gut. So what happens when you swallow the fight response? All that propellant and energy that wants to come out to negotiate the boundaries goes right back in. It concentrates and it becomes really potent, much more potent than it's meant to be. And imagine what happens over time, like decades of doing that, right? You're storing really potent life force, which is essentially what traumatized is. It's a storage of life force into an organ, into a system in the body. 
it greatly affects the health of that organ, the health of that system, and eventually the health of your whole body. So that implosion, this is why I make this claim that the implosion is far more destructive to your body than the eventual decline of the relationship. You can all think of a relationship that fell apart and how you survived it and how that feels, even if there's grief. Grief is so much better than the implosion, truly, than what it's like when you're just swallowing your boundaries. It's a very different experience. Don't take my word for it. Feel in your own body for yourself. Camille, where do you want to take us from there? Uh, the other thing that's coming up for me when we think about the implosion of, round, of boundaries or the suppression of our boundaries in an effort to maintain a relationship, which what can actually begin to happen, and Luis was alluding to this, is that resentment can then begin to come up. So we think we're preserving the relationship, but because we're suppressing our boundaries, because those boundaries are now imploding, and like we said, it's much worse having it implode than actually express it, then resentment begins to come up. I'm just feeling that for a moment. You know, the whole, the whole, when we're talking about boundaries, all we're really talking about is agency. It's all we're really talking about at the end of the day, right? Agency, the way I see it somatically, is just my, my co creation with my body to move. That's all it is. It's just to move, to express, to respond. Not necessarily react, though sometimes that can be your agency, but responding, expressing, moving. Something's overwhelming, something hurts, moving away from it. That's my agency. Now, it tends to, this is, this is part of that one question about discernment and accountability. It was a great question because, but she's speaking to, is this understanding of, am I reenacting a childhood trauma of pleading to be seen, right? I'm going to say it again. Am I reenacting a childhood trauma of pleading to be seen? If you're in a situation where somebody can't hear you, like they can't, they won't, they say they won't have accountability. Let's say they're outright denying your experience. Regardless of ethics, you're facing somebody that doesn't have the capacity for you. That's just the reality. What you're bringing to them to repair, what you're bringing to them for responsibility and accountability, their body can't hold. Okay, you can take that where you want to in your own lives. That has helped me greatly. Number one, have compassion for people. And number two, turn away from people that don't have capacity for things that involve us. If there's pain involved, if I'm looking to them to help repair the rupture and the source of the rupture doesn't have capacity, just like this question is alluding to, I'm going to reenact rupture over and over and over again you everybody's families right now you know like when you think about like the holidays or birthdays or just seeing them you think you're supposed to you know family you have rupture with let's say going to them isn't the problem going to them with the expectation for repair when they don't have the capacity or even the language for it that's where the actual problem lies the good news about that problem is it's within me i'm taking myself there okay that's a big thing to understand and so I'm just pausing so we can catch up to that in our own bodies. I take myself to you because of an expectation and a story and a desperate attempt for repair that I have, that you are going to heal something in me through your kindness, your accountability, holding space, all those things. Those things, accountability, kindness, holding space, those all take capacity Capacity is somatic. It is not intellectual. You can't will yourself to have capacity. You can will yourself to push beyond your capacity and appear to be present, but you can't actually will your capacity. So if someone can't be accountable, they're showing me they don't have capacity for the situation. And then I have this amazing opportunity to notice that and ask myself, okay, can I be in relationship with them anyway? And if I can't, I must move away. The way the hand moves the mosquito without thinking, my body can move me without thinking or stressing about it to the next experience. Next therapist, the next friend, the next employer, right? If I need to leave a job, like whatever the situation is. And in that movement is that expression of boundary, that force that moves up in us. We all know that feeling when anxiety comes in. And all it wants to do is live through us and become alive through movement through movement. 
And what happens is there's a repression against it because we're afraid of what might happen based on really good information from the past where something bad did happen when we spoke up. And speaking of discernment, where sometimes it is really good to repress a boundary. You know, if I think of times in my life where I've had fawning, especially sexual fawning, it was really smart for me to repress a boundary because I could have got really hurt if I would have yelled or fought back or showed my disgust. But to let myself or let my body, I couldn't even help it. That's the beauty of a trauma response. The trauma response took over and appealed to the person, in this case, the predator, right? And let them think I was okay. And that let me live. So there's moments we want to repress boundaries. We don't want to always just run around yelling at everybody, everything we feel. That, that'd be an unintelligent thing to do. We'd walk into situations that could be really dangerous for us. We don't want to live in the repressed boundary, right? If someone is screaming at me and I scream back and I'm going to get punched in the face because of that on the street, that's a good time to repress a boundary. Then when I get home, I move that energy through me through somatic practices. So even to myself, there's never a repression. There may be in a situation because I don't want to be harmed. But then when I'm alone with me or with my people, like someone was saying, I can express the thing that's still stuck in me to myself. I can witness. I can hear what wanted to be said but couldn't be. And that's also how we repair childhood ruptures and violations as adults. The memory comes in, we feel the situation, and we witness it now. Our, our actual conscious mind now witnesses the part that expresses that wasn't able to then, witnesses the boundary. All it comes down to somatically is expression, movement, the release of stored energy. The only reason anyone is sick with PTSD or chronic illness related to trauma is because you're actually filled with too much energy. You're exhausted from too much energy. It's not that you don't have enough. It's not that you're broken. It's not that you're weak. It's that you're so overcharged with energy meant to move you. Okay. And boundaries are the way that we move that energy in response to too much, in response to overwhelm. What would you like to add to that, Camille? I uh, just really want to reiterate the point you made about there are times where we are going to need to suppress our boundaries to avoid consequent consequences or punishment or even life and death situations. But what's really important about this work is helping the body to be able to discern between when there's threat present and when there's not. For example, for some of you, for many of us, when we were in school and we fidgeted, we got punished. So being in a classroom setting, being in a class setting, the body is now internalized. It's not safe for me to move. But notice if you, your body is doing that right now in this moment. And notice if your body can attune to the fact in this class setting, it is safe for you to move. This is how we begin to discern the difference between when is it safe for me to express a boundary versus when might I need to suppress that boundary and express it later. And we're going to play with that right now. So one of my favorite practices, anyone that's ever studied uh, somatic experiencing, it's called the walk up. And it's when uh, an object moves closer to you and you do this when you want it to stop. Okay. Now the way we're going to, I'm going to be the object. So the way we're going to do this is you're going to learn in your own body and do it a couple times so you can get used to it. All I'm going to do is come back like this and I'm slowly going to move forward. And everyone is going to have a different thing in their body. And I'm not taking this personally, so don't worry about me. But when you feel that thing in you, when you feel that constriction, when you feel that energy move up, I want you to do this with your hands and say, stop out loud, just so you can feel what it's like to feel the constriction and let it come right through in a relational setting. Okay, so I'm going to start back here. And I want to be clear, actually, one more thing. As I come up, some people are always like, no. So <laughs> as I come up, um, I because there's so many people here, normally if it was like 10 people or even one, when this happened, I would pause and you would feel what that pause feels like. I can't know I'm going to do that perfectly because the amount of people. So play with your own boundaries. If I keep coming forward, move yourself back from the screen and see how that feels, okay? So I'm going to start coming forward just like a little bit by a little bit. I'm going to pause as I do it so you can notice your body. And don't think if it's appropriate, just let your arms come out when it's time. Yeah, good. 
And I'm going to keep coming for those others that haven't and move your bodies back if you need to, if I keep coming forward. Good. Now I'm going to stop for a minute. I saw a lot of stops and see what it feels like. I stop. Now I'm going to push back and watch how it feels in your body when I come back. Notice the ease that some of you will feel, the breath that comes in. Okay. I'm going to come forward again. And the pause is going to go to the next page so I can see other people. Okay, I'm going to come forward a little bit again. Yeah. Just feel that when I stop. And I'm going to move back and see how your bodies feel. I'm going to go back, notice the ease that comes in certain places. And then just give your hands a little shake, look around the room. I am going to come forward. And just notice, actually, I would love for you to um, speak. <laughs> we will not do popcorn. There's too many people. <laughs> but um, put your hand up. I want to hear really short, like 15 second shares. Like what happened in your body when you just did that? Dominic. Yeah, I instantly started crying when I set the boundary. Like my body instantly released. Um, it's really interesting. Thank you. Laya. Hi, uh, Camille. Uh, it's sorry, it's Leah, but thank you. <laughs> no apologies necessary. Thank you for correcting me. Um, so for me, uh, it was it was so profound because I immediately felt uh, that I stopped breathing, like my heart just went like 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 it's a rock, like there was no breath. Um, and yeah, that's that's what I felt. Anna. Um, the first time I even forgot to say stop. So my voice didn't come out. And then I noticed that every time I rocked, then I could have you come in closer and it felt safer if I, my body was rocking, which is what it was wanting to do. Grace. Yeah, so when you first gave the directions, I was kind of like, I'm not really going to feel anything. But then I, I guess, like, in my distraction, I was kind of like, oh, that's the thing. Like, how you described it is um, wait for the thing to happen. And then it happened, and I was, and you, like, stopped when I actually said stop out loud. And um, it felt really nice. It felt like um, there was more space in my stomach, kind of. So that was pretty cool. Thank you. Beautiful. Let's do two more, Camille. Stacy. I was really surprised how activated I got, how quickly, like to say, I just the level of threat felt really intense. Um, and then I felt, I found myself crying when you started to move away. Like that's when all of the emotion released. <laughs> And Kelly. Yeah, for me, it was very much, um, I noticed that I didn't say the word. I, I was able to do the motion, but I wasn't able to say it. And I think because my chest was very constricted and tight. Um, and when you moved away, I could feel it opening again. So as you came closer, it got tight and stuck. And then when you moved away, it opened and I could breathe. Gorgeous. Excellent feedback, everybody. Uh, so what's so profound about this practice, what we really want to get from this, look how much information came up in your body when you were somatically aware of your boundaries, right? When you felt that thing, like I forget who said it was like, I didn't think I was going to feel it. Grace, I didn't think I was going to feel anything. Whoa, I, I felt the thing you were talking about. Now, I'm someone you have no negative history with, to my knowledge. And so imagine what it's like when you're around a body that you have decades of history with right and you're in actual physical space you're not on a screen that's a big deal that's a lot of, so you just learn so much about your body what it feels like when it wants to have an expression of a boundary and some of you even said i forgot to say stop something didn't even want to come out right so again we're learning that that how it feels to embody it 
when we express it how it feels and the parts of the body that fight against the expressing because they have overcoupled expression as something bad is going to happen right i'm moved by people who said they cried as i moved away because the moving away means you have space to now process what's in you so when i'm talking about boundaries i'm talking about overwhelm the, the connection there this boundary with the stop all we're doing is showing what do the hands do right the hands if there's something coming to me to my face or my body it's getting closer i'm getting overwhelmed by its proximity and my hands push the person away it's not about hurting them it's about creating space between my body and their body and in the creation of space my body unfolds it says oh i can process now there's less information there so this isn't even about violence this can be someone you love dearly and their shoulders touching yours on the couch and it's just too much right and it's, especially if you're neurodivergent and your nervous system is highly activated easily or a, a lot a lot um a lot of senses are easy to pick up on like you're really like hyper hypersensitive not in a negative way but like you just feel a lot it's going to be even more extreme to your body and you're going to judge it and think you're overreacting. Now, sometimes you're triggered and overcoupled. You know, we call overreactions overcouplings because it's reminding you of a past event. So this person, this experience now is actually quite pleasant, but they remind you of something unpleasant. So there's something incongruent. That's a whole other thing. What I'm talking about in this case is overwhelm based on the proximity of something loud noise and i turn the volume down the the air waves the vibrations literally retreat from my ear it's all about space between my body and the stimulus right and i say stimulus so we don't just hear predator it's not always about anger and violence anything that stimulates you someone you love more than anything talking really fast and you can't keep up and you're getting overwhelmed it's really innocent things it's not even harm or malice so it's important that we just learn to embody how it feels when we get overwhelmed and want to have that expression. We just played with this one today. They're like endless. But think about, again, boundary is expression of agency to try to create space between me and the stimulus overwhelming my body, not making what the stimulus is doing something about them. My body's overwhelmed, not to blame yourself, but to give yourself the power to respond to it. If I'm overwhelmed and I'm like, you need to stop overwhelming me, I'm in a freeze response. I'm stuck in my overwhelm waiting for the other person to wake up to what they're doing. If I feel it and just let my body move, it's instant renegotiation of boundaries. And I start coming down and have the ability to process, right? So let's just feel that, catch up to that. You know, especially uh, those of you that didn't get to share. But a lot of you loved seeing how many people did the practice. Just feeling what it's like to notice, oh, what did that teach me about my body? Right? I really appreciate what someone said about the rocking, how the rocking helped. That was important to me because again, it was Kenna. We're talking about um, we're talking about agency and expression and movement as it relates to overwhelm being boundary expression. So if I'm having a conversation with someone in the store and I feel the tension build, we tend to bypass the tension and it just builds and builds and builds. But what if I just start rocking while I'm talking to them? That might be my body's boundary. That might be the agency moving and expressing itself through me. So I have the capacity to sit there and talk to them. There's nothing wrong with that. But again, how many of us feel comfortable letting our bodies do what they want to do to be able to tolerate or be in a situation, right? It's very rare. And it, it harkens back to what Camille brought in. You know, from a really young age, we are rewarded for dominating the body, for ignoring the bladder, for waiting for the hall pass, for not being able to fidget, for being really quiet, right? Not speaking, not even eating when we're hungry. So many things we get rewarded for bypassing to be good and to be successful and productive that by the time we're even 10 years old, We've had a long years and years and years practice of denying and completely abandoning what the body wants to do to the point where just doing this, swaying in front of someone, I feel weird, right? That's pretty intense. So it's really good that we can learn that boundaries aren't always like, get out of my life. Like it's this, these big catastrophic ones we think about. They're as simple as I rock when someone talks to me. 
They're as simple as I say to my friend, I need two minutes of silence. They're me turning off all the things in the house that are making noises like podcasts or a TV or a radio and just walking a little slowly for five minutes. Like those are all boundary renegotiations. I'm choosing to renegotiate what my body's taking in this moment, how much information I'm, I'm, I'm alive with, right? And the more you practice in those more subtle, simple ways, the easier it gets in the deeper, more difficult relational ways where you have to actually say to people like the way we relate doesn't work for my body. You know, can we do something different about this? What are you talking about? No way. There's nothing I'm going to, they just told me about their capacity, right? Do I unconsciously dominate them into accountability or do I let them live where they live and I move into another space, right? That's up to all of you, but that's what I've been asking myself for a while. And I find that if I am trying to force accountability, it's still force. If I notice that they aren't taking it or that we have two different perceptions, I don't want to force my perception onto them. I'm going to take mine and take it somewhere else to be nurtured. And that's within my agency. Camille, do you want to add something to this? Uh, yeah, just some uh, final thought around agency. Again, noticing, do I use my capacity? Do I use my body's energy to try to change you, to try to convince you to be or do different? Or can I use my body's capacity, my body's energy to attune to my agency, to attune to the choices that I can make? And this goes back to what Luis was saying earlier, that boundaries is real, are really all about agency. And for many of us, like we were talking about, we've, we were taught really early as children to bypass our boundaries. We were rewarded for doing it. But take a moment just to notice this one difference. I'm not a child anymore. It can seem really simple. But notice when or how your body may respond as if you're still a child if there's a particular age that comes to your awareness. And just notice how the body might respond to you articulating, I'm not eight years old anymore, or I'm not a child anymore. Let's feel that one together. Let's feel the difference between what it was like being young, having no choice. And even in this room that you're in, the choice that you have, even in this moment, maybe not in five hours, but right now, just seeing what part of your body can feel that. you know i'd love to actually do two or three minutes of weaving about where that goes for everybody like i'm really short 15 30 seconds just like you heard people do already you can put your hand up and camille will choose people and in the meantime if you look in the chat you will find um I'm just thinking, you will find a link to the donation for this if you want to. Uh, it helps keep it free for everybody. And I'm also putting a link for the wait list. Our last course of the year is October 30th. So it's the end of October. So if you want to do this work with us and go a little deeper, you can learn more about the course there. Um, let's hear where this is going for us. What are we feeling around this piece with agency expression, the exercise, everything, whatever is coming up for you? Cecilia, please come up from you. Hi, thank you so much again for these lovely uh, instructions or suggestions. Um, I found that having given myself permission, I was excited to set the boundary on the second exercise. So it, it was less, um, less of a challenge uh, because I was, I was anticipating like doing something for me. So that permission that came with the instructions was, was a nice touch. Thanks. Love that. Tanya. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, I was like, caught off guard. I was in my thought of how I was feeling in my body. Um, I've done a lot of inner child work. And when she said, I'm not a child anymore, the way I have multiple children, I've come from a very traumatic background, but I have multiple inner children. But when you said that, it was just like, it, they just held hands. Like, I don't know how to explain it. It was just such a huge mm -hmm. somatic feel in my body that like I could feel it in between my sacral and my throat. It was just this like, 
I'm not. And literally almost brought me to tears in such a profound sentence and such big feelings with that, like somatically. Thank you. Beautiful, Tanya. Thanks. Let's do one more. Uh, Joanna, please come off mute. Uh, uh, so what's coming up for me is just interacting with this idea that my boundaries have to do with my body. I think a lot of the boundaries I've had in my life have come from past experiences and they've been very mental. Never again, not that I'm very black and white. And now feeling them in my body, I'm noticing fear because I don't always trust my body because sometimes my body does addictive things or sometimes my body's playing at old traumas. And so that's what's arising for me. So this is a great, a great share to end on, right? Because the real practice with all this is building trust between my body and myself. And, and we get trust by practicing, like, is what I'm hearing really what I'm hearing? And learning how to even discern the language of the body, which is sensation. It's not always instruction. It's often sensation first. And from the sensation, maybe instructions or movements emerge. But that's a, that's a lifelong practice to build a sense of trust with the body. And it's why we didn't get to go into it as deeply as we wanted to, but we have many more to do. It's why we like somatic fluid boundaries. Because when you are able to relate and listen and kind of decode what the body is showing you, the boundaries show up as they need to show up rather than a mental construct of a boundary because you don't know what to do otherwise. So you just choose one thing, you just stick to it. Often that's not even congruent with how you feel. So just like you said, like never again, you said that 10 years ago, it might be different now. And you hold the boundary because you think it's not supposed to be different, but we're fluid beings. We change all the time. So there are times when not being in the room with you is really good for me. And there are times not being in the room with you isn't very good for me. Where's my fluidity? And talk about humility, like to have people in your life that will humble themselves and for you to humble yourself so other people can do that with you, to let you know when they're too overwhelmed to relate and then come to you when they're not. It's such a gorgeous way to be in a relationship. And so it's, it's a real practice. It's strange. We don't have a lot of examples for it. We haven't been, you know, we have didn't grow up practicing these things. So it's new and it's kind of countercultural. So it takes a little time to to play with it. But it's why we do these drop-ins. So you can see there's people out there that want to do this, that are doing this, that you're not alone. There's nothing wrong with you. We're just kind of navigating this strange world together. And um, I'm very grateful for all of you joining today and sharing and bringing your heart and excellent, excellent questions. Uh, I would say go to the website, look for the next free session we're doing. I believe the next one's the Addiction Circle. We have a membership library, which is no contract. You can join it whenever you want. There's tons of practices there and you can leave and come and go as you please. Um, many ways to work with us, okay? So I thank you all so much. Thank you, Camille, Marika, and Evan. You can unmute if you want to and say goodbye. You're being recorded. I'll see you next time.